Hey everyone, welcome to part seven of our DevOps Masterclass. And in this part, I actually wanna dive into containers and friends. So Docker, Kubernetes, Helm, all of those various components related to containers. I wanna be super clear. Containers is not necessarily DevOps, but it's increasingly being adopted as a core technology and utilized in many modern app environments because of its flexibility, speed of deployment of resources. It really built around the idea of these microservices that enables me to develop individual elements of our all up service without impacting all of the others. And everything we're gonna see is all built around this declarative as code type deployment. So therefore it's very, very useful to understand the basics around containers. But again, it's its own set of resource and technologies. It doesn't change the overall DevOps cycle that we've discussed previously. Now, as always first, um, if this is useful, really do appreciate a like, subscribe, comment and share and hit that bell icon. So firstly, why do we even have these container things? And we've been used to the idea of virtual machines for a really long time. Why do we need something else? So if we think about really what is a virtual machine, if we think about the idea that, well, there's some server. Now that server has certain resources. That server has certain amounts of CPUs certain amounts of memory, certain network connectivity, amounts of bandwidth, certain storage. That storage could be local. It could be remote via um, iSCSI, NFS, whatever that might be. And what we really wanna do with virtual machines is we virtualize the hardware. That's really a key point. So on top of this server, we have some type of hypervisor. And that hypervisor, in this case, is kind of a, a type one hypervisor. It's sitting directly on the bare metal. It lets us create these virtual machines. Now that virtual machine essentially has its own allocation of virtualized hardware. It has a certain amount of kind of virtual CPU, a certain amount of memory, certain links to networks, so it has that network connectivity. It will be given portions of storage. There could be more advanced configurations where, hey, I have access to things like GPUs. But then I can have multiple of these virtual machines all on the same piece of hardware, each with their own allocations of resource. Now, the server itself, there's really different elements to that in terms of kernel mode, user mode, i.e. really privileged core things. So I can think about with these hypervisors, you actually get this idea of kind of a, a ring zero. I can think about the kernel elements and then kind of ring three, and there's, there's other rings in there as well, kind of this user mode space. And within these virtual machines, they see all of that. Because the hypervisor actually runs at this kind of ring minus one thing in the processor. But within the virtual machine, therefore, hey, each of them have their own operating system. It could be Windows, this one could be Windows, this one could be Linux, whatever I want. Then there might be various kind of run times, various types of middleware and then I kind of have my app, I have my data. And exactly the same things, this could be app two, app three, etc. So we have this ability to completely separate out, divide up the physical hardware into these virtual machine environments. Now, why do we use those? Why do we bother with the virtual machines in the first place? Well, one of the big reasons is isolation. Every virtual machine has its complete own separate kernel, user space. There is no interaction between them unless I enable it through things like the networking stack. 
which is just regular network communications. So one application cannot mess with another application's address space, um, with the namespace of things it's running, things it's using. But there is a cost to this, because it's running a complete operating system, and we'll talk more about that. The other big thing this gives us is kind of resource control. Because if we think about it, well, every virtual machine has a certain amount of CPU memory network. It can't use more than that. So if I have multiple virtual machines, each of them get a slice of the resource of the actual physical box, and they can't use more than that. So it helps me control the actual amount of resource, amount of CPU they have, amount of memory they have. I can use things like quality of service and limit network communications. I can allocate IOPS and throughput for the storage, the amount of storage. I can control all of those things. So these are all good things. So again, why a virtual machine is not the be all and end all of everything? There are some downsides. So when I create a new virtual machine, Creating the VM is fast, but it, it's its own OS. I have to get the OS brought into there. The OS may have to go through some initialization when it starts up for the first time. So these things can be slow. It may take minutes, which doesn't seem that slow, but it can take minutes to actually get a new virtual machine up and running. And if I'm trying to create something that's very dynamic and responsive to requests coming in, if I think microservices, hey, someone puts in a request to give me information, I might want to go and spin up a new instance of a service to research that and then respond back to the answer. I want to be able to do that maybe in seconds. Well, spinning up a VM and waiting minutes it really is not a great answer to that. So even with optimized images, everything else, it's still fairly slow comparatively to create and delete these virtual machines. Additionally, every VM has its own operating system. So it has a high overhead. Every operating system consumes a certain amount of disk space. It's a complete OS. Now I can do things with deduplication, with parent child disks to reduce the overhead there, but there's still overhead there. And then the OS is running processes. So those processes are using up certain amounts of memory, certain amounts of CPU cycles. So if I have 20 VMs on the same host, I've got 20 times the memory use of the operating systems. And not many hypervisors do a very good job of actually deduplicating memory. Even if they say they do, generally they don't. With things like large memory pages, generally you're not gonna really save any significant amount of memory. So there's a high overhead there. There's high management. Because they're a complete operating system. There's patching, there's backing up, there's antivirus, there's firewalls. There's whole sets of things I have to think about. Also, often, but not, there are things I can do. Generally, they are not prescriptive. But as we saw in previous weeks, there are ways I can kind of PowerShell DSC, Chef, Puppet, make the OS prescriptive, but generally they're not. So it's very hard to sort of repeatedly create these things. And they're generally not portable. I.e. the app I have in there is very much tied to the operating system. I can't easily take this complete configuration and apply it somewhere else. So I can't guarantee I'll always get kind of the same result. So there, there are challenges there. I can get a lack of consistency and all of those, they're not good things. So. If this is kind of virtual machines, and don't get me wrong, these are still the right solution for some workloads. Virtual machines is just the right solution for some things. But what we're moving to for some types of applications is the idea of, well, actually, I'm going to use containers. Actually, I don't want to use that color. I'm going to save that color for something else. We'll just say containers. So what exactly are these things? So if I think about a virtual machine virtualizes the hardware, well, with a container, we're gonna virtualize the operating system. So remember this picture, we had the server, a hypervisor, and an OS within the virtual machine. 
So if I think containers, they're still a server. So we still have the server there. Now, I could have a hypervisor here, but this container host we're gonna talk about absolutely could be a virtual machine. But it could also be on bare metal. And then there's an operating system. So here we think about, again, there could be a hypervisor, this could be, this OS could be within a virtual machine. That, that is a supported thing and it is very common. But it doesn't have to be. And at this point, this is kind of the container host where I'm gonna run my containers. Now what we then have is this idea of kind of a container runtime. And this is kind of an important point. When you think before with virtual machines, there was this hypervisor, and then VMs ran on top of the hypervisor. Well, this time we have the OS, and there's this thing running on top of an OS. So remember we talked about kind of the kernel mode, the user mode. So if you think kind of we have kernel, and then user mode. So it's a shared operating system. And then what we have here is we would have the actual containers. So here I can actually think about, okay, this could be container one. This could be container two. We have these sandboxes we build on top, container four. Now there's different things running. So I can think about, hey, this is kind of my app one, app two, app three, app four. They may have requirements around different runtimes, different libraries. Now what's interesting, and this will make more sense, they can actually share some of that. So I think, well, within the container, it knows about a kind of set of binaries. So maybe these share certain binaries and libraries. Maybe this shares from a file system perspective, a different set. And then they're gonna be built on some kind of OS image. So maybe those kind of share an OS image and this uses a different OS image. So there are kind of these layers at play, which we're gonna talk a lot more about. But these are all our containers. And each container is running a certain application. Now, it's isolated at the OS level. It's creating this OS virtualization. But the isolation is at a user mode space. They're sharing a common kernel. So there's an OS which has the kernel. These are each getting their own set of namespaces. It uses technologies like C groups and namespaces. They have their own views of the network, of the process space they can have controlled amounts of resource. But they are sharing a common kernel. And they're running on a certain OS. So this image it uses, this OS, it, it has to be the same as the physical OS of the container host itself. Like I couldn't have Windows here on a Linux container host because it's still running on this OS kernel. But it's a whole bunch of virtualized spaces actually that makes up the container. So now I can run these isolated spaces that have their own isolated process spaces, those namespaces. What does this actually give us then? Well, if you think about it, the application is now the focus. In terms of what I'm dealing with, it's all about the application itself. That's what we care about. It's gonna be consistent. The developer works and tests in containers. It might check in some code to create the container, check in an image, and it can now deploy through various environments. Because these containers are kind of sandboxes of those process spaces, but it's gonna run an image. And we're gonna talk about what those images are, but we kind of hinted already that there were these layers to it. So it's gonna give us this great portability. With a virtual machine, there was always this problem that, um, well, I'm deploying the app to an OS instance, 
oh, what about if I forgot about a certain runtime or middleware component that had to be installed on the OS for the app to work? So then I work finding dev test doesn't work in production. With containers, it's based around this image. Well, that image contains all of the layers we need. It contains all of these things. So all of this is an image that runs as a container. So I don't have problems with missing dependencies anymore. So I get fantastic portability of this. It's super fast. When I create a new container, I can create this in a second. So it's not spinning up a new OS. It's spinning up this new kind of process space, this sandbox on top of the container runtime, and the image is up and running. And we'll see this actually in a little bit. I'll show create in a container. But they're super, super fast to actually create. They are prescriptive. As we will see, these images that I'm going to be using are built off of kind of as code. I create a composition file telling me, well, what, what is the layer? How do I build my image? And then I can store that image and use it time and time again. But I still get this idea of they're running in their own space. So I still get isolation at the user mode space. So one process cannot mess with another. And I can also do resource control here as well. I can still limit how much memory a certain container can have, um, how much CPU, the storage it gets access to. I still have those capabilities even with my containers. But they're much smaller overhead. So when I think about what I'm having now, it's not running a complete own operating system. It's running on the OS of the container host. What it has to run are the components for its application space. So I can think about low overhead. So I can fit far more kind of application containers on the same piece of hardware than I could with a virtual machine because I'm not having to run many, many copies of the OS and all of the overhead that actually comes with that. So that really helps us get more out of it. And when I think of DevOps, well, this rapid ability to provision and react because of that declarative nature makes it perfect for that kind of life cycle idea when I think about the overall DevOps process. Now, I keep talking about this idea of, hey, layers, uh, and this idea that, hey, there are these images actually that runs inside the container. So let's kind of talk about that in a bit more detail. So if I go over here, so let's drill down into exactly what, what is this container thing then? So if I think about a container as a sandbox, So this is a running container. So that container is our sandbox. That container has the isolation. Again, at that user mode space, they share a kernel. And I keep stressing that because on premises, or if it's our environment, we're fine sharing a kernel. We trust our neighbor. If there were maybe scenarios where I'm running on a container host that's got multiple different people, do I trust my neighbor? Then I might want kernel mode isolation. That is possible in things like Windows containers. It spins up basically a managed VM. So it's still a container, but it runs in this automatically managed VM that's very thin. So now I have kernel mode. It's basically one container per container host. But there's still a higher overhead there. So ideally, we, we try and avoid that. But just realize that may be the case if I do things like container as a service where it's multi-tenant. I don't want to share a kernel with someone I don't trust. But if I do trust my neighbor, I'm fine sharing that kind of kernel space. So we have this isolation at the user mode space. And we think about what I'm actually going to run inside here is a container image. So what is a container image? So a container image is built up of layers, kind of like a traditional box you're using. If you think about your PC, 
your PC has kind of an operating system. You might have done some configuration to that operating system. You might install some kind of run times um, actually onto it, like maybe a .NET or something else. Um, maybe there are some more kind of um, add-ons you kind of put in this thing. And then you have the app, let's say app one. So that is a container image, but it's made up of layers. And the reason for this is it actually comes from other images. So if I want to build an image, like from my app one, there was probably an existing image that I'm building off of. Maybe this is like Apache or HTTP or something. I would build my app on top of another image. So this container image is my kind of app one image that I have built. And we'll talk about how we get that in a second. So I've got my image, that image is what actually runs inside an actual container instance. So that image would basically come over to here for all those different layers, kind of at one at the top. And then what actually gets added on top is kind of a read write layer. Because the images themselves are immutable. I can't modify. The t any of these layers, because then it would break the image for everyone else. So when I actually run a container image inside a container instance, another layer is put on the top that I can read and write to. Now realize, if I delete it, I, I lose that stuff. But while it's running, I have this read write so I can make changes, I can do various things to it. So we have that whole idea. So as a developer, I'm going to use containers all the way through. I'll develop on it, I'll test on it. I'll have this composition file that actually goes and creates it. And my development environment may actually go and create that for me. So what exactly is that? Well, I talked about layers. I talked about maybe there's add-ons, there's runtimes, there are these other things. So the way I actually create this container image is we're actually going to have a composition file. So I might think about over here, I have a Docker file. So this Docker file is basically going to say how I build the actual image itself. So it's all of the commands. So I might build on top of another image. So I might say, hey, I'm building from, let's say, HTTPD, HTTP daemon. Now that itself is an image. So there is another image up here with all of its layers that maybe is like HTTPD at the top. So this is the HTTPD container image. So I'm saying, hey, to build my image, I'm building on top of this existing image so I'm going to bring that in as part of creating mine. Then I'm going to do certain things. Um, maybe I'm running certain commands, so I could do that. Maybe I'm doing copies. I, I have various things in my composition file to actually go and create my new image. So my composition file builds on another image and then does some modifications to spit out my new shiny image that I can then run in an actual container. So this is the whole point, and that composition file is declarative. I'm saying, hey, this is what I want to do. It's prescriptive, I can see exactly the steps to actually get there. So let's actually look at one of these files. If we jump over, so what I'm going to quickly do is let's look at our files and we look at our Apache version and I have a Docker file. Now mine is super simple. You can see here, what am I doing? Well, you can see it's basically just saying, hey, from HTTPD. So HTTPD is the image I'm going to build on top of. Now, I want to modify what's there by default. So by default, it has kind of, oh, this folder, it has a default website. I want to delete that. 
So I'm running a remove command, and then I'm running a copy command to copy the content from something local, i.e. either website folder, into its web folder. So basically I'm replacing the default website. So this is really not doing anything super, super exciting. But that's what this is doing. So it's a composition file to build an image. Now if we actually go and look, I could see what images I have by default. So I can run Docker images. Now Docker, I'm gonna keep saying the word Docker over and over again. So Docker is really kind of a standard, both in terms of, hey, the ability to build images. It's also a container runtime. It's a set of management tooling. It's many, many things. But it really is kind of the standard when it comes to containers. Now we can see on this box, I have a whole set of images and we can see what I actually have is, yeah, I have that HTTPD image installed already on the box. So we can see I have HTTPD latest, it's right there. And I have a bunch of other images as well that I'm using for other things, but we won't worry about that right now. There are repositories where images are stored. So I can absolutely go and search, for example, Docker search, this is gonna go and search Docker Hub, which is a internet publicly available registry for container images. And if I run that, I'm saying, hey, find me HTTPD image that is official. I've got a filter is official. And there's the Apache HTTP server project. And I've already sort of downloaded that. So I can pull things actually from that by using the Docker pull, so it would download it. And I mentioned there were layers. So we can look at these. If I actually go and say uh, Docker image history and look at that image that I've already pulled down, these are all the layers. So these are all the separate layers that make up that image. So we can see, hey, yeah, so there's some base and there were changes made to environments and CMDs and Apache with all of those things actually go to make up this final image. Now that is not a container at that point. This is a container image. I don't actually have at this moment any actual containers. If I do a docker ps-a to go and search, I have no running containers. Now, I could just run this particular container image. So if I did a docker run, and I'm gonna call the container instance, I'm gonna create httpd run, and then I'm using that particular image, and I'm gonna do it interactively, I could open up bash. So if I run this command, this is now gonna actually go and create a container instance running that image. Now I'm just kind of disconnected from it, but now if I actually go and look at my container instances, I now have a container instance up and running. So I can see it's there. I could, for example, actually go and get the Docker ID for that particular one that's running. And if I wanted to, I could attach to it. So if I actually now go and attach to that container instance that's running, I'm now running inside of that container. Notice I'm now switched, I'm now running Unix. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait, this is clearly a Windows box. Um, you said before, that the container has to match the OS that it's running on. And that's absolutely true. This is Windows that has the Windows subsystem for Linux on it. So the Windows subsystem for Linux lets me actually run Linux applications on the Windows box. So it's running Windows subsystem for Linux too. It actually sets this up when you install something called Docker Desktop, which is a good way to go and start playing with this. And it's running in the Linux mode. So my actual container runtime on this box, my Docker, is actually running on the Windows subsystem for Linux. So I cannot actually run Windows containers on the Windows box because my container runtime is running on top of actually Windows subsystem for Linux. So I'm essentially running a Linux environment here. So that's why we're seeing what we're actually seeing. But if we go back, so I'm actually running in that container. This is all within the container itself. Now, from here, for example, let's get out of that, but I could do whatever I want within there. Now, because I did an exit, 
if we actually now go and look again at our containers, you can see it exited. My status, if we actually go and look over here, you'll notice, is exited, because I typed exit instead of kind of a con control P, Q. I could attach it again, I could start it, or I could say, do you know what, I'm kind of finished with that example, I'm just gonna remove it. Now before I do that, actually super quick and fun, there is an extension, I'm using VS Code, there is actually a Docker extension, and you'll notice it actually shows me information about containers running, about the images I have on the box, it could have registry information, so this little Docker extension is actually really nice when you actually start using uh, containers as a way to kind of interact and that says, hey, that container has gone. But let's go back to this Docker file. So this is my very, very basic Docker file to create my own image. Basically build it on top of HTTPD, but then I wanna remove the default website and copy in my own. So if I look at the file system, if I go into this um, Apache directory, I have my own website. And my website has some index pages and some pictures. So that's my kind of website. So what we're actually gonna do is if we go into that folder, oh, what is wrong with this? Let's go back over here. Oh. CD Docker. Then we go into that folder. There we go. In the wrong place. But if we go into that folder, I can do a Docker build. So I'm saying, hey, I want to build an image called Bad Father using the current folder. So notice it's, it's building layers. So it's written a new image layer on top of the HTTPD. So if I look at the history, notice it was the old Apache image, all those existing layers, plus my own layer. Because now I've got, hey, copy the website, I've added my own thing to it. And if we actually keep looking down, if I now look at my list of images, I'll actually have a new image. I've got my bad father image. And we can see the size of my bad father image is basically the same as the HTTPD image. There's pretty much no difference between them. If we go over here, see there's my image, 138 megabytes, and it's basically the same size as the HTTPD, because all I did was copy in a tiny amount of data. It's not restoring everything again, it's just showing me what the actual total size of it would actually be. So I have my own image. Now what I could absolutely do at this point is I could run it. Now it's a container. Um, it's using the underlying OS, the networking stack, it has its own view, but depending on how I configure it, it doesn't have its own publicly accessible IP address. So what I can actually do is, if I open up a web browser super quick, so if we just jump over to the web browser, just give you an idea of how this can work. So what I'm gonna do is just go to itself. Oh, let's do a refresh. It's doing it from a cache. All right, so it doesn't exist. There is no page. There's no website running on this box right now. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna create a container called badfather-app using my badfather image. And um, you'll see what's interesting about this is in terms of actual configuration of this command, I'm telling it to map port 80 to port 80. So port 80 on the box, the host to port 80 in the container, i.e. HTTP. So now when I actually run this command, if I actually start a new container using that image, if I go back to the website now, now the website is there because it's now running a website. It exists again. Now, if I was to get the Docker ID, store that, and then if we actually do a stop on it, 
So now I've stopped that container instance. So again, I created my own image and I created a new container actually using that image. Now we're gonna do a stop, so that stopped. So if I go back to the website again and refresh, it's gonna time out because I stopped that container instance. But you saw how fast that was. You saw how quickly I was able to actually create that new container. So when I think about benefits, this is huge, that fast deploy, and again, it's super low overhead, is really useful when I need to create things very, very quickly, use them for something, and then, hey, you can go away. So I really can think about these microservices that get spun up as required, and then go away again. So those are super, super powerful. Now, other things I can actually do, if we go back over there for a second, is, well, that image I created, I could actually store it. Now, I could go and put it in a registry somewhere. There are other things. I've got commands in here. If you want to go and look around, I've got the idea here that I can actually take that image and push it to things like a Docker Hub. So I can authenticate and then actually copy it in. So this is actually me going into an Azure Container Registry. And then down here, I've got actually pushing it to Docker Hub. So I've got examples of using registry. And again, a registry is really just the idea of, hey, I want to be able to store my container images. Now, if I actually go and look at my subscription, and we look at our container registries, I have a container registry. And if I look at my repositories, I've already kind of copied this up there. So I copied up bad father, it exists um, in my registry. The commands I did to do that were exactly what you're seeing here. Basically, I created a tag. So I authenticated to my container registry. I tagged that image, I another name, as the image I want it to be called in my registry, and I just pushed it. So that's how I put it into my container registry. And now I can actually go away and delete the image locally. I don't need it anymore. Um, I can't do it. So I don't think I actually finished. I've got a reference in that somewhere already. So I'll go and clean that up later. What do we actually have? Oh, so let's check. So let's look at what images, uh, containers we have. Oh, so it's still running, that's why. Okay. So remove it, remove, kill the container. I think I did the wrong command before. And then I can remove the image. Okay, so there we go. So now I've deleted the container that was running with it, and I've now removed the image that I built. But it would still exist in that container registry. I've copied it over into that particular registry. So these are just some of the commands um, I could actually use to do that. So again, this is in the repo. You can go and check all these out if you wanted to go and play around with it. So there are different types of registries. So absolutely, we have the idea that, as you just saw, this HTTPD here, this is stored in a registry. The Docker composition file, guess where that goes? That's going in our repo. So that same Git repo, we've had our application code, our infrastructure as code as everything else, that goes in our repo. That container image we built, we're gonna go and store now as an image. So we now have, hey, app one, as an image in our registry. So that's now available to be used by actual other things. So that's kind of a, a key point. So Docker Hub, Microsoft has their own container registry where it puts its public images now. When I'm building these images, remember the whole idea of DevSecOps and shifting security left? I would probably do a scan. What are my um, dependencies that I'm using? If I have things like Azure Container Registry and I have Defender, 
when I push an image, it will actually pull it down and scan it with Qualys to look for any vulnerabilities in there. So again, I want to be able to do those things. My pipelines would be the things to actually do these builds. I'm not manually doing this. If I go and commit a new version of a Docker file, my pipeline would then automatically, hey, I'll go and build the container image. I'll go and store it in the registry. I'll tag it with a certain version. Then that might trigger a deployment to some environment. So all of those things really will just kind of fit together for my kind of all up solution. Now there are obviously other elements when I think about a container. I've said this is very much, hey, it gets created and it runs, but when I delete it, I lose everything. Well, I need to be able to talk to things. So there's absolutely a whole concept around networking. And there's, there's different modes for this. There's things like network address translation, where it just uses the container host, so IPs to go and communicate back and forth. There's things like transparent, where it will actually get real IP addresses from the real network. That may sound appealing, but it can be super dangerous if these containers really are created for a few seconds, then deleted. Created for a few seconds, then deleted. Think about your actual physical network and things create and delete, create, delete, create, delete. The ARP resolution, your routers, the equipment really may not like these constant flood of things registering and then going away, registering, going away. So if we really have those very short-lived containers, I probably want to use kind of that NAT. Then there's kind of a layer two SDN type model um, when, when I'm hooking into other types of service. What about if it does need persistent storage? Well, again, there are ways I can actually go and connect to external stores. By default, it gets kind of this local area from the host while it's running that it can do things, but I could absolutely go and connect it to some external storage that if I actually need some kind of long-lived storage. But a key point of containers is we always talk about pets and cattle. Um, servers, we're used to them being pets. We name them, we patch them, we care about them. If they're sick, we heal them. Containers really are cattle. I don't want to care about any particular instance of a container. So generally, I don't want to super focus on long-term storage. Ideally, they're stateless. And the service would actually go and communicate with some kind of data tier. So maybe I have a, a database tier where the state lives that I really care about. So that, that's the ideal scenario. But again, I may have stateful containers. I can actually run things like SQL Server or database in a container. Then I definitely want some kind of durable storage so I don't want to lose my database tables. But really focus on the idea that these are cattle. I do not patch containers. Remember these layers? There was like that OS layer. There's that HTTPD application service layer. If there's a patch to the OS, an update to the OS, I don't try and upgrade the OS in the container instance. I would build a new version of my container image off of the new version of maybe Ubuntu or HTTPD as a new version. Because remember, HTTPD itself is actually built off of some maybe Ubuntu image. So HTTP uses the Ubuntu image, then my app uses the HTTP, there's a sequence. So if there was a new version of Ubuntu released with new OS features or patches, HTTPD would build a new version of its image off of the new OS. Well, if there's a new HTTPD image version, I would rebuild my container off of the new version. And then I would just redeploy my container instances built off of the new image version, which has the new HTTPT in there, the new OS updates in there. I'm not patching these things. Now, I won't just redeploy them all at once because then my app is down. I might, again, those different deployment strategies, maybe blue-green, maybe rings, canary, whatever, I would deploy a grouping of them at a time to keep my service available. But yeah, these are cattle. I'm not caring about these. If there's an update, I create a new image, I deploy the new version of the image. I'm never doing any maintenance really about the containers themselves. So I use Docker to build them. It can provide me a runtime environment. It gives me commands. Um, 
Now in the cloud, if I'm running containers, I could create a virtual machine and run the container host, like an Azure VM or an AWS VM, whatever. There's also container as a service, like an Azure, there's Azure Container Instance. It will just spin me up a container and run an image I give it. That's when it uses things like these sort of managed VMs, because in a public cloud, container as a service, I don't want to share a host with someone I don't know. I, I don't trust them at the kernel level. So that's when you might actually get that kernel mode isolation. But I mean, there, there are challenges with this though. So this all sounds sort of super nice. Yes, containers are fantastic, but that's a container. I probably want lots of containers. So how do I auto scale? How do I do those upgrades when there's a new version of the image? How do I do that? Am I running a load of commands to create, delete, create, delete? How do I find other services? So service discovery. How do I load balance? How do I integrate with load balancer services, maybe in on premises, maybe in the cloud, to balance between the different containers I have running? Um, how do I have controls? I might have multiple container hosts. Maybe sometimes I want containers spread out over the host, like an anti-affinity, um, to make sure I'm resilient. Maybe sometimes I want things on the same host because they need to communicate a lot, so I want affinity. H how do I do that with this? How do I really handle storage volumes? How do I really manage on bulk the networking? So containers are great. Docker is great for the concept of this isolation of my application. It's not great when it starts to come to a real enterprise application, and I really need something else to provide me this larger scale orchestration to really make the, the Docker containers usable in a big way. So how do we do that? We use Kubernetes. So this provides us with that enterprise level orchestration. It's still using the same containers, it's just, it's providing a lot of things on top to actually make it a true enterprise solution. So, let's talk about Kubernetes. So I'm gonna kind of keep those bits to the side. So Kubernetes. Now you may often see Kubernetes actually written as K8S. Kubernetes, and there's eight characters between the K and the S. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. K, eight characters, S. There you go. So, Kubernetes is made up of a number of different components. There's really the control plane I can think about of Kubernetes, the management plane, and then where my actual nodes are running. So let's think about that control plane first. Now for the control plane, obviously they're saying I have to be able to interact with the thing that provides the all up management brain of the service. So what we have is the API server. So the API server is what actually communicates with the various nodes we're gonna have actually running containers it's how we interact from a management perspective. And then we have to think about, well, I wanna create containers. Something has to work out, where do I put this container? So there's actually a scheduler service. And that talks to the API server, to and then the API server can go and actually go and say, hey, I need a container created over here. Now, obviously this is stateful, so it uses a database. So it uses the etcd database to actually store the state. And there's a whole bunch of controllers for node health, for replication, making sure there's the right number of pods, etc. So there's multiple different types of controller. So again, there's multiple ones of those that again talk to the API server. Now, I could absolutely install those myself. There's huge amounts of documentation on installing Kubernetes, but often you'll see a lot of the cloud providers um, will actually have a solution for this. And I'll talk more about this, but kind of 
you'll see like AKS, um, Elastic, there's all these different services you'll actually see out there. But you can absolutely just install these. In your environment, I could create my own Kubernetes. Now, that also means I'd be paying for whatever resources these are consuming. Now, in terms of the initial interactions, as a user, I'm kind of sitting here on my computer. There's this cube CTL couple that talks to the API server as a way of interacting with my Kubernetes environment. So I have this kind of tool down here that actually lets me, I'm gonna draw it down a little bit, that lets me interact actually with the API server. So we'll see actually running the cube CTL quite a lot. Obviously, then I want to actually run my containers. That's obviously the whole point of this thing. That's a, a management control plane. Where do my actual containers run? Well, then this will seem familiar. We have the same idea that we're actually going to have nodes. So let's say over here I have kind of three nodes. So these are just container hosts. These are nodes, we call them nodes. Now on these nodes, I still have that familiar container runtime. And there are different container runtimes available. Uh, container D is very popular, but obviously Docker has a runtime. So I'm going to do CR. So I'm running my container runtime. Now remember I talked about, hey, there's the API server. It has to be able to communicate with the nodes. So we actually have on each node, this thing called the kubelet. And it's this component that communicates actually with the API server. So that's how it gets told, hey, go and create this particular container that I need you to run, etc., etc. There's also another component kind of the cube proxy. So I've kind of got that down here. And that's for the networking. So that's how it handles all of the kind of networking components of our environment. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So we have to run our actual containers. Now in Kubernetes, the smallest unit we talk about is actually something called a pod. And I have multiple kind of pods running on the box. And then inside the pod is where we then actually have a container. Now it's typically one container per pod. If I had multiple containers that were very tightly coupled when to share kind of uh, address spaces and maybe networking, I could put them in the same pod, but it's really not that common. You might see the idea of a sidecar. Sometimes you'll see a, a sidecar in the pod, which is another mini container. Maybe it handles a certain task, like if I was having a, a networking mesh, um, I might have a sidecar to handle elements of the networking. But think of a pod, very similar to a container. Containers run inside a pod, but a pod is the unit that we think about within Kubernetes to actually run our work. Now, we don't normally actually create pods as such. Remember, the whole point of this I want to think about high availability, I want to think about auto scale, I want to think about resilience. So what we normally do is we have concepts which we're going to talk about of things like deployments. And a deployment might use another concept called a replica set, which has controls over how many instances of some bit of work I want, which will then go and create the pods to meet those requirements. So we very rarely even deal with pods. There are these higher level abstractions that we actually use to interact. But then that's kind of our solution. If we think about it, so we have, hey, we had the pods running our containers, running on these nodes. And again, there's pods all over all the different nodes. And it solves a, really a lot of those challenges that we had originally. It's giving us all of the various capabilities that we need. Now, these worker nodes themselves, I can have lots of nodes talking to the same Kubernetes environment. And what we may actually do is we group them into pools. 
And again, there might be others. Pool two. And really we group them into pools around maybe some set of capabilities that the nodes in that pool represent. For example, there's always a system pool. And then I can have optional kind of user pools. There are certain pods that have to run for Kubernetes to function. So there were always certain pods running like core DNS and other elements. So they run on the system pool. Then I might add other pools. I could run my own apps on the system pool as well. But maybe I have certain nodes that have GPUs. Well, hey, in that instance, I'll create a pool with the C GPU enabled nodes. And I can actually have something called taints. So a taint is basically some element that I add to the pool, maybe AM GPU enabled. So then pods will only get put onto that pool if it has a tolerance for the taint. So to get allocated to it, I have to, in my description for my deployment, say, hey, I tolerate a GPU taint, and then that can help me control which pools should my workloads actually get deployed to. So I have this whole configuration to help control those things. There's also namespaces. Um, so we'll actually see a, a group of different namespaces available to us. So if I actually jump over to here for a second, so what I'm now gonna do is actually switch over to kind of the Kubernetes world. Now I'm using AKS, so that's the Azure Kubernetes service. If I actually go to the portal quickly, what we can see is I've got a Kubernetes environment actually up and running. Now the whole point of this is really that, you know, I just, I don't want to manage that control plane. I'll talk more about this. And so this is just managed for me. It just provides all of that for me. I can do things like, hey, have multiple node pools. I could add node pools. It can do things like upgrading the Kubernetes version. It does all of the work for me. But then I can still run my various workloads. And these are some of those core things I talked about. But notice the namespace, cube system, gatekeeper system, which we'll talk about. I can see what pods I have. So all of these pods here are basically the core pods it needs to function. Look, cube proxy, we can see that over there, core DNS, um, tunnels, networking, gatekeepers. Notice it's using replica sets to actually make sure it has the required numbers. I have all these different types of things available to me. So that's without me actually deploying any workload to this environment. So the whole point is I'm actually using this for my Kubernetes environment. And when I have that, what I can now do is I would get credentials for that AKS cluster. Now I've already done that. So I can actually scroll down and I can run those kubectl commands. So I can get cluster info. So I can say, hey, yep, you're running, Kubernetes control plane is running, core DNS is running, the metric server is running. But I could also do things like, well, kubectl get namespace. And we'll see the same things we saw in the portal. I have kind of that default namespace. So if I don't specify a namespace when I'm doing a deployment, it will go to default. But then we can see, hey, look, there's the gatekeeper kind of namespace over here. That's for policy, which we'll talk about later on. There's the kube public, which is publicly accessible data, even if I don't authenticate. Uh, things like uh, cluster info. There's the system processes over here, so we don't touch those, we stay away from those. But I really think about, I create new namespaces based on some natural kind of coupling that I might have for the containers I'm actually creating. So namespaces help me group things together from a logical perspective in terms of the Kubernetes management. Maybe I'd have different namespaces for different business units, maybe different namespaces for different environments, uh, test, um, prod, maybe blue, green. There's many different options to how I can actually handle that. Now, this is great. I'm saying we don't generally, we don't worry about containers anymore. We don't really worry about pods anymore. We have these higher level things. How do I actually deploy 
to Kubernetes. How do I actually do anything on this thing? So the way Kubernetes works is it's all built around declarative technologies. So what we absolutely have is, well, I have my Kubernetes YAML file, my, my manifest of what I want. So these are all the things that I actually want to exist. And then there's different ways I can use this, but I could think about, hey, um, from kubectl, I execute that. I say, I want to do this deployment, go and actually create this in the environment. But that file is stored in my repo. Again, it's not some weird different place. It's in the same place. But I can deploy it through here. I can have things like services I need, maybe load balancers I need, all described actually in my file. So let's take a look at one of these. So if we now jump over to my Kubernetes demo, let's look at our files. So what I'm gonna actually look at is, as you kind of guessed it, my bad file Apache. So that was the image I built, remember. Now I have an AKS YAML file. So what we're looking at is, is like an API version. If I'm doing a deployment, I'm gonna call my deployment Bad Father Web 1. Now, this deployment, I'm gonna have a specification. I want two replicas. So whatever I'm specifying here, I want two of them to actually be created. So two pods is what I want. And then what I've got is these selectors. So I'm, I wanna match on Bad Father Web 1. I'm gonna create here, my image is from that repo I uploaded to. So remember, if I jump back over to here and we look at our container registry, I have that image in here. I'm referencing this exact image. It's just gonna use the latest version that I have. So that is the name of my registry. So it's using that bad father image. Notice I can control resource use. Hey, I want them to have limits of 250 milliseconds of CPU, 250 um, megabytes of memory. I'm mapping port 80. And then I'm actually gonna have a service. It's a load balancer annotation because it's gonna use this load balancer, and it's selecting, what is it gonna balance? Well, it's gonna balance Azure Bad Father Web 1, i.e. these labels that I'm specifying here. So I'm telling it what I want. I'm not telling it how to do it, it's declarative. Hey, I want two replicas of this particular specification. I'm telling it the image that I want it to use. I'm saying I want a load balancer that on port 80 that's gonna balance apps of this type. So that is my actual declarative YAML file for my Kubernetes environment. So I'm not worrying about pods. I'm saying this is what I want. I want two instances of this app running in the environment. Now, if we look right now, remember, if we go back to our AKS environment, and we can see, remember, all of our nice deployments in this, this great environment, I do not have bad father running. Also, currently, it is hooked into a load balancer, and you're gonna see all of this works for us. There's a Kubernetes load balancer, and I just had this one kind of front end right now. And the back end pulls are the hosts themselves. So what we'll do is let's deploy bad father. So from here, if that's our specification, we're gonna apply that YAML file to our cluster. And that was it. So, so that was it done. Let's go and look at our pods. Notice, it's not, it's not showing me the system one, so I'm just seeing my user kind of pods that I'm creating. You can see it's, Container creating right now. And they're running. 
So see how quick that was. So those pods are actually now up and running. So I've done a deployment and it created two of them because remember that was my desired end state. If we go back and look at our workloads, well now what we can see is look down the bottom, Azure Bad Father. And it created it in the default namespace because I did not specify. It's also showing me there were two instances of it. I can go and look at that. Okay, there are my pods. I can see it's using one replica set, which we knew about. I could go and get live logs. I could see the YAML of what we actually kind of deployed. But also what it did is, well, if we look at other things like services, it created a bad father one load balancer. We can actually see it's got an external IP address. If we click that, well, there's our website. Because what it did behind the scenes, it integrated with the load balancer automatically. And if we now look at the load balancer, it's still just one, but we have a second front end configuration now. And that is what now goes and points. And as a service gets tagged to the pods that are offering my bad father website. Backend pools still goes to our nodes. And then that cube proxy maps it to the service, which maps it to the correct pods to actually show that site. So that was all that was required. You saw how fast that was to actually go and stand that up. Now I could change that deployment file super easily, may make an internal load balancer, and it would just go and deploy. I wouldn't actually have to do anything else. It will just complete that for me. So the speed and the capabilities I get out of this are huge. And that really is one of the, the key points around all of this. Now, as I kind of showed, this control plane, absolutely you can run it yourself. However, more commonly, a lot of us when we're using the cloud, I have zero desire to install Kubernetes and manage Kubernetes. I don't want to do that. So most of the time what you'll do is, well, in Azure, there's things like Azure Kubernetes service. You can even automatically upgrade the Kubernetes version of the management plane and like things like the Kubelet and that on the nodes themselves. For AWS, this will be things like ECS. So these are all managed offerings. Now, depending on the SLA, you may even not, there's a free offering, for example, in AK, I don't even pay for that at all. Or I can get an SLA backed one, obviously then cost me money. So there, there are different options around that. Um, I, there are features like Azure Container Instances, which remember Azure Container Instances is a container as a service. It just spins up automatically. And there's actually a component called a virtual kubelet which can then talk to the API server to maybe, hey, I normally run my pods on my nodes, but maybe I get some huge burst and I don't have enough node capacity, and they can actually go and create them in ACI uh, and give me that kind of dynamic capability. However, when we think about scale, we can auto scale these things. And there's two levels of auto scale. So the first is in my deployment, I can actually specify auto scale kind of for the pods. So in this case, I can say, hey, I need more pods based on Q depths or CPU or pressure. So I can auto scale the number of pods I have. Now, obviously, if I keep adding pods, I might fill up the nodes themselves. So then I can actually have the idea of auto scale nodes. Now the auto scaling of nodes is based purely on the scheduler. Remember the scheduler says, oh hey, I need to deploy more pods. So if it has pods stuck in kind of a pending state, it cannot deploy because there's not enough space, then it can actually go and create new nodes to actually. So the auto scaling of nodes is based on the scheduler pod placement. So hey, if there's pods stuck in pending and it can't deploy them, 
it can then go and auto and add new nodes. It can scale in as well. It's, it's a lot more weighty. It doesn't want to scale in too quickly, uh, but it can do that as well. In Azure, this is built on things like virtual machine scale sets to actually do that scaling. So there's a lot of tight cloud integration with these components. So yes, Kubernetes has all these different components. The reality is if you're using the cloud, you're not installing Kubernetes on VMs in containers. You're gonna use the clouds managed. Then they're taking care of the resiliency of that control plane. It's just a much better all up experience for you. So this is not something you want to do. You're just gonna leverage the native clouds capability. And again, Google has their own version, et cetera, et cetera. So then I can just, again, focus on my work, which my work is the YAML file. And remember that YAML file, what did it do? Well, that was my deployment, but it actually referenced from my container registry, the image. So I've got a registry of my images. The image was built off of a composition file in my repo which was built by a pipeline that put it there. And I could have another pipeline that then has a deployment file, deployment using the image that it built to push it to Kubernetes to create the pods to run my service. So all of these things actually kind of come together. Now there are details to all of these elements. I don't wanna go into a lot of them. I think maybe it's more complicated than it needs to be. Like Docker, there was networking. Kubernetes has the same set of concepts. So there's something called KubeNet. KubeNet again uses NAT. So all of the communication um, to the outside is, is translated um, by the cluster. There's also like in Azure, there's CNI. And then it does have its own, the pods have their own direct IP address from the virtual network. So that this whole container networking interface, it has its own, the pods have their own IP addresses. So it could be communicated with directly without any kind of natting having to go on. But there's communication between the pods, there's communication from the outside world. You saw the load balancer in the Azure case that is used to have ingress coming in, which would then talk to a certain service, which then goes to the various pods. Actually, traffic going out goes through the load balancer as well um, in the AKS world. What about storage? So from a storage, again, it's normally ephemeral. It might have kind of this empty directory volume that's mapped to something local on the host just so it has some kind of play space while the pod's running. But when the pod goes away, that storage goes away. We don't need anything else. But again, there might be times I want persistent storage. So if I need persistent storage, so let's say I, maybe I'm running SQL Server in this pod, well then I want some kind of external storage. And we have to think about what environment. Do we have NFS storage? Is it uh, iSCSI? If it's in the cloud, is it Azure Managed Disk? Um, is it Azure Files? There's all these different options. So the way essentially this is gonna work is there's different services we could use. So if I take Azure, there's things like Azure Files. So Azure Files is SMB based. So because it's uh, a protocol, a file based protocol, I could have multiple pods used connecting to the same Azure file share. Or maybe it's Azure Disk, which normally would just be one pod per disk. So you have various different types of service available. Now with Kubernetes, what we have is kind of storage classes. So these storage classes are built around the types of offerings we have available to us. And then so to map it through, what actually happens is within the container, well, sorry, the deployment file, we have something called a persistent volume claim. I want a persistent volume, persistent storage, that has a certain set of requirements. Maybe it's a certain amount of space, certain type of read-write access of a certain class. And obviously the class maps to, let's say, Azure Disk in this case. So when we do that, now, I actually need the thing created. So a persistent volume claim then maps to a persistent volume. 
and that persistent volume maybe then goes and creates a managed disk. Now, it would be possible that I as an admin go and create a whole bunch of persistent volumes of various sizes and characteristics so that when an app developer says, hey, I need a persistent volume, they make a persistent volume claim, it goes and looks at all of the persistent volumes that exist, which one matches my class and my, my specifications. But if I'm creating a lot of these, that's a lot of work to pre-create all of these. So by using the storage class, what it actually does is it dynamically creates the persistent volume of the size requested in the persistent volume claim of the type asked in the storage class, and it just creates it for me. And there's actually these, for example, in AKS, these are built in. There's ones around disk, um, regular and premium, and files, kind of regular and premium. It would just use those. So I really don't have to do very much to do this. I just say in my deployment, hey, I need a persistent volume claim, and then I map it to a certain deployment, and then mount it as a certain folder, and it's just then available as local part of the file system, but it's actually mapping through to some external persistent storage. Um, to see this in action, I'm just gonna look at a file. So the way that all fits together is, if I look at my storage provider, so there are built-in ones, but what I'm doing here is, instead of using the built-in ones, I'm kind of creating one um, just to kind of show you the complete story. Again, you wouldn't normally have to do all of this. There's things like default and manage premium. But what I'm saying is, hey, look, I'm going to create a new storage class. So if we look at what we have here, what we have over here is I'm creating a new storage class and I'm calling it Azure Disk Custom. But it's using Azure Disk. And I'm saying it's standard, locally redundant storage, and it's a managed type. So I've just specified a few things, but it's an Azure Disk Custom. And the reason I'm bothering is, well, normally you can't dynamically expand the built-in storage classes. Well, I'm saying, yeah, I can expand it. And retain is set to true. So even if I delete the pod, it's not gonna delete the disk it actually creates. So that's me creating a storage class. But again, you don't have to do this. There are built-in ones that I would probably normally use. But then I can now create a persistent volume claim. So my persistent volume claim, as you can kind of see over here, I'm saying, hey, my persistent volume claim, I'm gonna call this claim MS SQL data. I wanna be able to get read write once. I want to use the Azure Disk Custom Storage class we just created above, and I want eight gigabytes. So I'm saying the size I want. So what that would actually do is when I use this, it would now go and create a persistent volume using that storage class. I would actually go and use standard LOS managed disk, and it will create an eight gig disk. The way I use that is here in my actual deployment, if I look here, I can see volumes area. So in my volumes area, I'm saying I'm gonna use up a claim. So that matches the name of that persistent volume claim. I'm using that claim and I'm gonna call it volume MS SQL DB. And then in the pod, I'm saying I'm gonna mount a volume, MS SQL DB, so that's the same name as the volume we got from the persistent volume claim. I'm gonna mount it under this file system space. So then var opt MS SQL is mounting the MS SQL DB volume, or well, the MS SQL DB volume is the MS SQL data persistent volume claim, which that claim, remember, is gonna have gone and created a persistent volume on standard LOS disks. So that is now persistent storage for our environment. So we can absolutely create those if we have a use case. And in my case, I was actually running SQL Server on Linux, but I don't want the database to get lost every time, even if I delete it. So in that way, hey, there's durable storage there actually for all of those things. That really is kind of a key point. So we've covered a huge amount, I know. How do we really deploy this stuff? And I've kind of already alluded to it. 
yeah, I can use kubectl apply. Uh, I can absolutely kind of do that stuff over here. That is not going to be what I'm typically going to do. Really what I'm probably going to do is remember my pipeline. My regular kind of continuous deployment. Hey, it sees, oh, there, there's a new commit or something. Um, pull request is completed. A pipeline would go and do the apply using that YAML file. There's also things like GitOps, where I'm not pushing to it, the cluster's actually pulling from it. So that's an interesting one. Um, and actually, before I talk about that, just really quickly, so this whole pipeline idea, if you actually go and look at AKS, just as one of the examples of this, it will actually go and set up the pipeline for you. So it actually has the idea of deployment center. And what Deployment Center does, it actually lets me pick a repo provider like GitHub. And what it will do is I will then authorize to the repo and it will actually then go and set up a CI CD pipeline in there, actually using Azure DevOps, it will set that up to build and deploy. So if I actually configure this, whatever that repo is, it will then go and create a pipeline in Azure DevOps to do the CI, to do the actual deployment for me automatically. But that's not GitOps, it's still a pipeline pushing to it. But it will do a lot of that CI CD work for me. Okay, so what, what's GitOps then? If that's not GitOps, what is this GitOps thing that you probably keep hearing about and I've talked about it a bunch of times. So what is GitOps? So if a normal pipeline is something external to the cluster pushing to it, a pipeline is getting the YAML file and it's doing an apply into the cluster via the API server. That's a regular way we deploy. GitOps is really the, I don't know if it's opposite is the right word. With GitOps, what we're actually gonna do is instead of updating from some external system and thinking about access it has and everything else, I'm actually gonna go and look at a repo for my configuration and then pull it in and apply it. So I can think about, I have the same Kubernetes environment running in my here. I have the same components, so I have that same kind of API server. Remember, that was the brain. I now have some extra components. Now the key one we're gonna focus on is something called Flux. So what Flux's job really is, is Remember this repo we had up here? I'll have a certain configuration repo that's gonna store all the YAML files configuration I want for this cluster. So what will happen here is Flux is essentially gonna sync this repo. And what it will actually do is when there are changes made, it will apply them via the API server that would then go and actually create the various pods and services and all of the various things. So nothing is pushing to it. When I make a commit to the repo it's watching for its config, Flux will see it and just apply it. So there's no external entities pushing into the cluster. It's looking and when it sees the repo has been updated, it's gonna go and apply it automatically. So if I go and change, add a new YAML file or change the YAML file for what I want deployed, it will see it and just make the change. Nothing is pushing it in. So the same concepts we're used to. Hey, someone on their branch makes a change, they test it, they put in a pull request, the pull request is accepted, it commits to main at that point. Hey, it would see it and it would go and apply it. Now it's also, um, it's not just looking at the repo. The other thing it's actually doing as well is I can tell it to actually watch certain images. So then if there's a new image version, it can see that and go and update my configuration to then go and apply it to my environment. So it's not just about the YAML file, if there's a new image, hey, I can see that and act on it and get that applied as well. So it's detecting, hey, there's a new version of my image, 
I should get that pushed out. Um, get ops, I can manually deploy. It's very quite simple to actually get these things deployed. Things like Azure Arc can deploy this to any CNCF compatible Kubernetes environment and manage those things. So all of that really does kind of uh, come together. So this looks fantastic. I mean, we have these YAML files, which is a particular service, easily get these things deployed. But there can be a challenge with more complicated environments. There's a lot of YAML files. I'm doing a lot of different deployments and services. I might end up 20, 30 different YAML files. Which ones do I pull down? Hey, I want to make a change. Which file is this particular value of a configuration in? So the other thing you'll often hear about, which I'll come over here, here is actually something called Helm. And Helm is really focused about the idea of being a package solution for Kubernetes. And it's really just gonna to bring together all of the various YAML files into saying what we call a Helm chart. So we have this idea of a chart. And you can firstly think about it as really just a, a structure on disk. So I'm gonna have kind of my chart.yaml file which is kind of the metadata about this particular chart. I can have a values file. So instead of having to go through 20 different YAML files to find the right one to change for what thing I want, I have this one file. And then what we actually have is we have a templates folder. There's also like charts, maybe a CI. So there, there's like a chart for maybe things I'm dependent upon. But we're gonna have a templates folder. And in the templates folder, I'll have maybe part one dot yaml, part two dot yaml, loads and loads of these files. But inside them, they reference the values file. They have kind of this squiggly bracket, squiggly bracket dot values dot whatever that might be. So I'm now not having to search around to change something about the all up service. This Helm chart brings all these things together. I could get, I have dependencies. And I'm basically, what happens is all of this basically gets packaged into kind of like a, a TGZ file. So it's put it in like a compressed folder structure that that's what I actually deploy. So I, I can think about this archive file if this Helm chart was my app. So I'd end up with a file, my app, dash, and it uses semantic versioning. So if this was version 1.3.5.tgz. So I'd have this is the archive of all of those kind of files. And then there's Helm commands. I can just do a Helm install essentially of this into my environment. And what's really cool is that this thing it creates, I can actually store in my registry. It's something called an OCI artifact. Now there are Helm repositories as well. But this open container initiative lets me take other things that's using this distribution spec and I can store it in my registry. And then this, I can easily deploy with the Helm commands. Again, it's, it's still Kubernetes. It's just packaging all of those files up together, giving me a structured way to deploy. My GitOps, Helm is a key part of this. Normally what we actually do with GitOps is not really individual Kubernetes, it's Helm charts. So this Flux will say, hey, look, there's a new Helm, and it will pull and get those applied. So I can bring all of these things in together. So we can actually look at one of these super quick. So if I, let's jump over for here. So this is a Nginx ingress controller. And they, this is actually their Helm chart. So it gives you instructions on how to use it, but it's Helm install. That's it. <laughs> It's using Helm 3, so Helm 3 got rid of a server-side component you used to have to use in the past, it was a bit of a pain. 
So now Helm 3 is nicer that it's just this client piece. Helm install Ingress Nginx, Ingress Nginx. And it will take care of all of those things. But we can see those core files. So we have the chart.yaml file, kind of the metadata about the solution. And then we have the values file. So we have massive numbers of different things that I can configure, but all in one place. So it's really making my life a lot easier if I do need to configure and change things. And then we have the templates themselves. These are the actual YAML files that does stuff. Now, let's look at daemon set YAML. What I should see in here, so here's an example, here we go. So notice it references squiggly bracket, squiggly bracket, curly brace, curly brace, whatever that is, dot values, dot revision history limit. So that's using the value from the values file. So I don't have to go and hunt through loads of different files. It's really brought all of that together to make it a lot simpler for me to actually use. So that's a key benefit of all of these kind of Helm charts. So when I think about bigger services, I'm typically not taking a bunch of YAML files and deploying them. What I'm gonna be doing for those bigger services is using Helm, because Helm has done the work in bringing together all of the YAML files, it's separated out, hey, the values and everything else, and then I can just do that Helm install to actually get it into my environment. Now, I mean, there are other aspects to Kubernetes. It is a huge topic. I'm trying to condense it down as much as possible. There is policy. You saw those gatekeeper components I had. Um, in something like Azure, I can actually use um, Azure policy for containers that goes and uses gatekeeper, but I can then put controls around all of the things I actually might want to do. For example, if I quickly just jump over to give you some idea of what you can do, if I just search for policy for a second, and if we look at the various definitions and I change the category to containers, so it's Azure Container Instances, actually I'll do, uh, sorry, it's Kubernetes, that's what I want. These are all the different things I can restrict and control. Um, con specified GitOps configuration, so I can easily get the GitOps configuration applied to my environments using this central um, policy. A, I should enable resource logs. There are things about privileged containers, accessible only over HTTPS, only allowed volume types, uh, only use internal load balancers, ports I can use, labels, all of these controls. I can create custom policies as well. Read only root file systems, proc mount types, images to be allowed, or CPU and memory limits should not exceed. All of these controls I have available using the policy. So just be aware there is like nearly everything else, there's this whole idea I can wrap policy around this to really protect and control what I can do. Um, GitOps, I mean, uh, we really focus on containers. You might see some things for other types of workload that just targets a repo for my configuration and pulls it down. But I mean, really this, this was it. This was the goal for this. Hopefully you've noticed all of these were as code. Hey, the Docker composition file, hey, a pipeline can go and build that and then store it in the registry. My YAML file is in my repository for the Kubernetes that it can get pushed with either my pipeline or GitOps, and it's using the images that were built from code from my registry to my environment. Hey, the Helm, all of those things, they could be in my repo, my chart, and then it can actually store that archive in my registry to easily go and pull that as an OCI artifact. Policy as code, so AKS, Docker, Kubernetes, single Git source of truth applied atomically whenever it's needed, version controlled, easy to recreate. They're cattle, remember, these pods. We're not upgrading them. Hey, there's a new version of something build a new image off of the new dependency image we have, and we just redeploy that out. So containers is not DevOps, but it's a key part of that overall ability to react and give us all of those services we want. So it's really useful to understand these key concepts. 
Uh, as always, a ton of work goes into creating these, so I really would appreciate uh, a like and subscribe. But uh, until next time, thank you for watching and take care.